Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Spearhead Sundays podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears. Bit of a di- different setup uh, today, I will say. I'm uh, recording this on a, on a fucking webcam using uh, a, a USB mic because the regular setup is just out of commission. Luke has the good camera uh, and the roadcaster is in the Luke and Lewis set. This is all I have for the moment, so I might do have to do a couple of episodes like this until... I just get a bunch of other gear uh, to reset up. Because, man, the fucking camera that we had, it's not going to be back in stock until May. I don't know. Bunch of bullshit. Doesn't matter. I'm doing the show here, and uh, I'm happy to be here. My tickets are on sale now. The Melbourne Comedy Festival starts Wednesday. Opening night of my show is this Wednesday, and then I'm doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I take Mondays off, and then I'm doing every single night except for Monday, 23 shows in a row. Get your tickets now. If you want to come to a weekend show, they are selling out already. Friday has less than 20 left. Saturday's gone. Sunday's almost there. Uh, Opening night, if you want to see the show at its rawest, come down to open night. Thursday, the first Thursday, I'm not going to lie, it's looking quiet. The rest of the shows are selling great. I want to see you there. Um, And uh, if you definitely, if you want those weekends, those Fridays and Saturdays, they're going to sell out uh, soon. Uh, the first so grab your tickets if you can only make it to one of those and just would you fucking buy them now i got after pay we take dogecoin if you <laughs> want to do that or we take australian money as well if you like depreciating assets um so yeah man i'm excited the trial show went off i've been working on my show all weekend uh all week really and uh look it's killer it's going to be great i cannot wait to get back out on stage I want to meet everybody else afterwards. We've got Alpha Energy merch. i got exclusive Back in the Trenches posters. And we are well and truly getting back in the trenches, man. I can't wait. Comedy is back. Uh, and uh, it's going to be fucking awesome, dude. We've got little, small, intimate, COVID-safe shows. And uh, I'm doing heaps of them in a row. I can't wait. We're filming every show. We're going to release crowd work clips. Uh, if you're not in Melbourne, I'm going to be coming to your city. If you're outside of Australia, ah, sort your country out. How about that, huh? Get on top of COVID. Then I might think about it. Don't ask me, oh, when, when are you coming to my shithole country that is full of riots and disease? Fix those things, and then I'll think about coming. Uh, until then, don't ask me when I'm coming. Ask your leader why they fucked up their response to COVID. How about that? And and then and then we can think about it. Um, no, but I feel for all, all you guys in the UK and the US. I hope I hope you guys get it all sorted out soon. It seem it seems like it's ending, right? It's I see the light at the end of the tunnel, even for the countries that that didn't do as well as Australia. Uh, it seems like it's ending. We got vaccines coming out. You got to wear sixteen masks, or or they don't work. We're on the we're we're surely on the tail end of this thing. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to come and do shows outside of Australia. But right now, do in Melbourne, get your tickets, and then I'm going to do the rest of the country, get your tickets, and then I'm going to do your mum when I get my new chin. Um, which is happening. Uh, but I, I ranted on about it all, all fucking last week. And, uh, you know, I think that's enough, me yelling about my chin. Don't you think? I think I just have a lot of anxiety about having braces. Guys, huge news in my life, massive news, 27 years old, no license. No license for 27 years, right? I've had, since I was 16, the opportunity to start learning how to drive, get my license. So 11 years, it's I've been 11 years and four months, I've been able to start working on my license. And you know what I decided last week? I reckon I'm going to start now. Because my life is fucked. It's, it's fucked. I live in Frankston. I don't want to go to Frankston train station. I get an Uber to a station a few stations away from Frankston because I don't want to deal with that mess. Have you ever seen Frankston station? It looks like a circus uh, if all of the clowns were, the, were also the patrons and all of the clowns that were also the patrons were also on meth, punching on with the police. I don't think I've ever been to Frankston Station or the vicinity of it and not seen someone getting arrested. That place is like the fucking airport, except there's there's no arrivals, there's only departures, and and every single departure is a is a ride in the police sta- in police car. 
I've never been around that station and not seen someone get arrested. When we had the last Luke and Lewis episode, Luke goes, oh, let's get like a good photo in Frankston in front of a Frankston sign to say goodbye and post on Instagram. And I'm like, dude, the only place you're going to get a good Frankston sign is going to be fucking Frankston Station. I don't want to go anywhere near the place. Anyway, he's had doesn't live in this area. He's not as street smart as me, you know. Not as fucking tough. So he goes, ah, oh, let's just go. We go there and we just immediately, immediately, I'm like, this is fucked. There's, there's cunts yelling at cops. There's, there's a lady screaming at a bus driver. There's the odd, like, uh, Asian walking around minding their own business, just trying to not get, like, racially harassed. Which, which, you know, is their right? Why do I have these headphones on? I don't need headphones. I'm putting them back on, you know? It's going to be that vibe. I'm not listening to anything. I'm just going to wear them for the episode and see what happens. Maybe it changes the vibe, you know? We're there and we're looking for a Frankston sign. We can't find one. And then we just hear, I got to be quiet, by the way. It's like 11.20. So I think I'm going to get this episode up on time. Because as, as we all know, it's Spearhead Sundays. So if you are on the Westgate, it's time to fucking get back in the car because I am on time as fuck, boy. Audio. Video is going to be late, but I never... I, I, I gave myself the out. Audio on time. Video can be a little bit late because upload speeds can be dangerous in these parts. So we get to the Frankston station and immediately, immediately, we just hear, ah, fuck, ah, real loud. Like the, the, there's something about meth heads screaming that is just the same wherever you go. For some reason, no matter where the crackhead is when they're screaming, for whatever reason, I don't know why, I don't know how the science of this works. It, To be honest, I think it could be magic. For whatever reason, when a crackhead screams, wherever they are, it echoes. You know? They could be out in the field and it'd still echo. You ever hear a crackhead scream? It's always like, fuck, 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 fuck. Ah, 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 ah. Doesn't matter where they are, that shit is going to echo. We're in Frankston next to the station. There's, it's a train station. There shouldn't be an echo. If I were to yell, there would be no echo. But for some reason, when the crackhead yells, fuck, 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 ah, shit, 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 echoes. There's something about a crackhead screaming that, that makes the echo. I don't know if it's the drugs, the rage, the, the angst, the hate, the meth. It's probably the meth. Something about it makes them echo every time they scream. You'll notice it now, now that I've said that. When you hear a crackhead just go, the fuck, it echoes. No matter where they are, city, train station, Frankston, field full of flowers, open air. That shit's going to echo. So we're there, and the first thing that happens, and I'm, you know, you know what I'm like. I love Frankston. I've lived here for a long time. Over a year now I've lived here. I love this place. I used to come here for work. I have family that lived in this area. I'm a big Frankston boy. I love the area, as, as fucked as it can be. There's a charm to it. So I, I'm always talking up Frankston and talking down the fucked parts of Frankston, especially to Luke, who is nothing like me. You know, he hates Frankston. He looks down upon it. He looks down upon us, you know, working class folk. Us lower socioeconomic class folks. He looks down on us He because he comes from the big diamond city. You know, like he can look down on Frankston when at any moment in his suburb you could see a cow. Okay, bro, we might have crack, but at least we also have running water and technology. You know he churns his butter? He's never had butter before. Luke Kidgel lives on a fucking farm. He churns butter, and every morning, if he wants a chicken parma, he has to behead a chicken. So he can talk down on Frankston all he likes, but the cunt lives on a farm, all right? And and if, if you are seeing his show at the comedy festival, and he ever denies that he lives on a farm, just ask him, when's the last time you saw a cow? He's gonna say this week. I haven't seen a cow for months, unless it's been in a video or on World of Warcraft. I don't see cows. That cunt 
If he goes home, he's going to see a cow. And I'm not just, I'm not talking about the women who live in Diamond Creek. I'm talking about cows. He, he lives on a farm. So anyway, I'm in Frankston and a crackhead's getting arrested by the police in front of me and Luke. And he goes, are you sure you want to live here? And I have nothing. What am I going to say? Oh, it's, it's not that bad. You know, it's not like, you're, it's not like we're literally watching a crackhead get arrested by the police at the train station in front of children at 4 p.m. You know, like, like I've been saying Frank's is not that bad for, for months. And then me and him witness a crackhead getting arrested by three police officers and kind of winning, you know? That's when you're really in Frankston. Is like, if you're in the city, you might see someone get arrested maybe once a month if you go there frequently. And it's always like one cop arresting one person and they're like, oh, this is bullshit, sir. But they still call them sir. In Frankston, when you see someone get arrested... It's always six on one, and and that's not fair odds. And I don't mean because six cops versus one person is unfair to that person. I mean they need more cops because it's when it's six on one, but that one has a bit of fucking ice flowing through the veins. You need eight more cops. You need 14 cops. When there's a crackhead screaming, fuck, at 4 p.m., and it's echoing even though... When, when, when you hear, when a crackhead screams and it echoes in an area that has no right to echo, you need 14 cops if you want to take them down. And that's just math. That's math, science, magic combined. That's what you need. So, look, the only thing I had to say in Frankston's defense at that time was, yeah, but the cops got him pretty quick, didn't they? You know? We're watching this crackhead screaming at high school kids, saying he's going to fuck them up. And that's bad, yes, but the cops got involved rapidly. Rapid, that's, and that's a real black mark on your suburb, is when the only thing you can really say that is good about the city or the suburb is that you, the, the police have a rapid response time, you know? And really, that's not a good thing because that means for a long time they had an average response time and too many people died so they had to up it to wrap it you know like where i used to live in the suburbs i would say they would probably would have a very poor response time and that's that's a good thing you know a lot of people have taken their last breath because of an average response time. But I have to say to those people that it ultimately is a good thing to have lazy cops. Because that means there's not that much shit happening. You know, you want lazy cops. You don't want... Have you ever seen a cop that's like fit and scary and he looks like he's seen a lot of action? That, that You don't want that cop. You want the fat cop in your neighborhood. I mean, when it's you getting stabbed to death under a train station, you are probably going to disagree with me. But in, in general, if, if I want to walk around my suburb and see a lot of fat cops and go, oh, there's not much crime here. They don't do much. They might rescue a kitten out of a tree and on the way up, they might snap a few branches because they're so fucking fat, but that's generally speaking a great thing because that means there's no, they don't need to be fit. If you are in a suburb where every cop you see looks like they can fight, that is for a reason. That's because they need to fight. Now, in this analogy, I am strictly talking about Australia. There's going to be a lot of Americans chiming in going, oh, all of our cops are fat, and that is because you live in America, okay? And you look at American cops, and you see a fatty, and in Australia, when I see a fat cop, I'm comforted. In America, when I see a fat cop, I think that guy is going to kill someone, you know? And that has nothing to do with his BMI, that just has to do with the America's general police training, as we've seen many times on Twitter. I'm not talking about your country, I've only been there once, and yes, I will generalize. And I will say things that sound true, and it will piss you off, and, and that is funny to me. Absolutely. Me going on TikTok and saying that Americans don't know what an electric kettle is, 
knowing full well that some of you guys know what it is, is a very amusing to me. And I will do it again. I, and, and I don't regret it. And I will allow you to fact check me. But the funniest thing about Americans chiming in and saying, oh, we do know what a kettle is, is the sheer overwhelming majority of you that don't. And that's always the case. When you make a big sweeping generalization about America, there's always one or two that can demolish your argument and break it down. But those people aren't seen, heard, or paid attention to because there is 98 million of you who are just exactly what we say you are. And that is funny. (laughs) And uh, I can't wait to go back to America. Because it is the greatest country in the world. If, and it's a big if, you're rich. And not everyone is. I'm not there. You're not there. So, look. It's time to admit it's not the best country in the world unless you're rich. You know? How did I get here? I was yelling about Frankston and fat cops. and Ah, oh, that's where I was. Fat cops. Yeah, that's how we get there. It's like that, that, that Wikipedia game. This podcast always ends up with me trashing America. And it always will. It's even when I live there. And that is my goal. Oh, if you hate it so much, why do you want to live? I don't hate it. But you can't deny you're not a funny country. I would say that out of every country in the world, America is by far the funniest to make fun of. And, and, and I would like to take this moment in time to really just say that, fuck, I look good today. You know? I went, I got a haircut, and bro, that the blue in my hair is gone. The only thing le- that's left is, is my little... A little bit of Justin Timberlake at the top, you know? That fucking blonde, grey, white, I don't know what colour this is, but I do know I'm looking nice. I went went all out at the barber. Went down to Paragon Studios in Armadale. If you go there, tell them I sent you. Best barber in town. I got cleaned up. They made me look nice. And then I did something for the very first time that I've never done before. I got my beard trimmed. And you know what, man? I'm looking nice. What they did to me is what I imagine I will look like when I have a jaw. When I got a chin, I'm going to look like this. And then I'm going to put a beard on top of it. Say goodbye to your grandma. I'll, I'll, I, she is going to leave grandpa for good. You're, you, when I get my new chin, and I knew I told you I wasn't going to talk about it, but here we are. When I get my new chin, you're going to try and get your grandmother diagnosed with dementia because she's going to forget who her husband is. You know? You're going to go, oh, grandma's got dementia. You know? She's forgotten who her, gran- who, who her husband is, and she's drooling. And I'm going to come in and say, that's not dementia, she just finds me so sexually attractive that she's forgotten who her husband is because he doesn't matter and that's not drool, that's pussy juice. And 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 I, I'm not going to touch her, I'm not going to fuck her, you have my word. But she will follow me until she dies. And that's not, I can't do, I, I can't stress this enough, it's not my fault, it's the way of things. It's just the way things are. Your grandmother's going to forget her husband and you're going to be following her around with a mop because I'm going to reactivate her pussy. Before my chin, you can ask your grandfather. I would say it's quite dusty down there. But, but you know, me getting a new chin, it's going to be like, that shit's going to be vacuumed, reupholstered and sopping. And that's just the way of things. Oh, fuck. Um, the Royals. You want to talk about that? I, I, I meant to talk about that last week, but I ended up talking about my fucking chin for 50 minutes. And you guys were like, this is great. Can't wait for next week. Um, the Royals. Isn't the, the, this whole Royals shit just so fucking stupid and funny that the whole argument... And the whole debate over the Royals is insane to me for three reasons. The first reason is like, 
why are people standing up for the royal family at all? You know, why does anyone think that the royal family would be good people? They're called, and I'm trying not to yell, they are called, for fuck's sake, the royal family. It's in the name that they think they're better than you. We are royal and you are not. Of course they're cunts. Do you really think the fucking group of people that live in a castle are nice? It, I'm sorry. Is this Pixar? Do we live in a Disney film? No, we don't. And also, Disney are racist. So, w w even the reality that you're thinking about is full of racist. What do you think about the real world we live in? The royals are fucked. Of course they are. Any family that has someone employed just to teach you table manners is a cunt. Full of cunts. If you need six spoons to have dinner, your mum's racist. And that's just a fact. Of course the royal family are cunts. Could you imagine living in that environment surrounded by like the pressure and the decorum and having duties and royal duties and being surrounded by the media, it would be fucking hell. But also, right, that's my first point. My first point is, of course, the royal family are cunts. And of course, Meghan Markle and Harry saying that they are racist is true. Do you really think that none of those people are racist? The family that is obsessed with bloodlines and royalty and family trees, you don't think... Anyone is in there is a little bit concerned about keeping their race pure, their bloodline pure, and not mixing with other races. You really think that that hasn't come up once? Look at Prince Philip. If a Japanese woman smiled at Prince Philip, he would die. Look at that man. That guy's a corpse. That guy was that guy was born three hundred years ago. Of course the man is racist. Absolutely. Didn't he come to... Prince Philip came to Australia and, and he asked... That's right. This is true. He came to Australia and he was greeted by like a, a traditional Aboriginal cultural fucking exchange event. I don't know what they did. A dance, a ceremony, whatever the fuck they did. I was too young to pay attention to it. But I do know that he came, and I saw it on the news. He came and he goes, he says to the Aboriginal guy, do you guys still throw spears at each other? <laughs> it's like, do you really think that the, the corpse that asks the Aboriginal elder if he still throws spears at each other, do you, you really don't think he's, he's never said something fucked at Christmas? Of course the dude has. Also, Harry went to a party dressed as a Nazi. Now, I'm not saying that he is a Nazi, but I am saying that he definitely would have grown up in an environment where people thought it was funny to put a swastika armband on. And, and, and I'm not saying that the dude should be cancelled for that. I'm not saying that cunts who have dressed up as offensive things should be cancelled. But what I am saying is he left the house dressed as a Nazi and no one said... Is that all right? You know what I mean? Like, the, like the, you have to have the discussion, you know? Like, when I tell a fuck joke, I always have the discussion. Is this all right? Yeah, I think it's funny enough. I reckon I do it. I think it's fine. It's not racist. And it's not fucked because you had the conversation. If you grew up in an environment where you just walked out of your bedroom dressed in full Nazi regalia and, and mum doesn't go... You look different today. You know, if she just doesn't bat an eye, there's an issue, you know? That's my first point. Of course, the royal family are cunts. It's the royal family. They think they're better than you. It's in the name, all right? Secondly, yes, absolutely, Meghan Markle and Harry are doing it for attention and money. For sure. If they... The, the thing that shits me about Harry and Meghan is their whole privacy argument. They would have me on board 100% if they just went, yeah, look, we just don't want to be royals. We don't want to be employed as the royal family. A lot of them are racist. 
the pressure is too much. We hate the press. Uh, we don't want to be involved. We'd rather just live our lives in America as private citizens, make our money, be celebrities. Megan wants to do acting. I want to do whatever the fuck I want to do. And we just don't want to have the pressure of being involved with a royal family that doesn't like my wife because she's black and doesn't like me because I don't want to follow the rules. I can respect that. But when they go on Oprah and go, oh, we just want privacy. It's like, bitch, you're on Oprah. Where the fuck did you think you were going to find privacy? If you want privacy, molest some children. The press will leave you alone at work for Prince Andrew. They don't want to talk about that. You know? It's like what I said in my real talk. It's like, fuck. Of, of course, they're doing it for attention. I don't, it's, just, it's just so like internet of like, oh, only one of these things can be true. Either the royal family is correct and perfect and they're doing it for attention or they're not doing it for attention and they don't want the money and they are only exposing the royal family for the good of mankind. Hey, both those things are true. The royal family are cunts and Meghan Markle is in it for herself. Absolutely. She's a fucking Hollywood actor. You got to be ruthless. You got to be brutal. You got to be cutthroat. You got to be in it for yourself if you want to make it to that level. Absolutely. And of course, the royal family are cunts. I mean, why the fuck would Harry want to be involved with the royal family after they treated, after the way they treated his mum, and then after the press was kind of the reason she died in a car accident? Of course, he wouldn't want to be involved in that kind of stuff. Uh, and to be honest, even if the royal family were nice, the press aren't. It'd be horrible being the fucking royals. The dude couldn't even serve in the military without cameras following him around. He's like, dude, let me bomb a hospital in peace. So that's what I think, is that it's all bullshit. And I am going to do a short little episode here for you guys today because I need to go to bed before the comedy festival. But I do have time here for miscellaneous bit at the end. I'm hoping that next week is going to be back in the studio properly and uh, better. So we'll see. Let's open up miscellaneous bit at the end. If you need a, some life advice or if you have a question, uh, reach out to me at podcast at lewspears.com. Summarize it in the subject line and let me know what you've been up to. If you have a question, if you have some thoughts, whatever. Um, miscellaneous bit. Hey, mate. Uh, on his podcast, Jim Jeffries has announced he will be retiring as a stand-up in around two years after his next tour. I know you are somewhat of a fan of his, and I was wanting to know your thoughts on him as a comic and how he helped you find your place in comedy. Alternatively, I would like to know if you have any certain end game in mind for your career or what your ultimate long-term goal is as a comedian Okay, I'm going to neck myself now because I'm part of the miscellaneous bit at the end. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I haven't listened to the episode um, that you're referring to. I googled it after you sent it to me. I don't know if it's true. Uh, so, sorry if I'm wrong, Jim. Uh, I think that's sad. I think I, that's, a, that's a shame if he's retiring. I mean, I, I hope he's doing it because that's what he wants to do. I bet it's, you know, selfish thing, but it's sad for me. I don't want Jim to retire. Or I want him to do shows fucking forever uh, so I can continue to enjoy them. I love Jim Jeffries. I think he's fucking great. Um, and uh, I think he's can still, I've seen him twice live, the best stand-up I've ever seen. I saw him, his, his two most recent tours in Australia, fucking incredible. Uh, and uh, I had a real fanboy moment when he replied to one of my Instagram stories. I was like, oh, fuck, I freaked out. So that was cool. He didn't follow me, but that's okay. Um, I love Jim and uh, I hope he's not retiring, but if he is, good on him. Um, my, Jim, to me, really, really demonstrated how, how far you can get like in comedy. Because before Jim, I mean, the biggest in, from Australia was Dave Hughes, right? Like, who is the next biggest Australian comedian? It's, it's got to be Dave. 
Uh, now, I mean, now there's like Ronnie Cheng, although I'm not sure. I, 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 I would say he's Australian. I think he grew up in lots of different places, but I think he like started comedy in Australia. I might be wrong. So I guess you, you could say he's an Australian comedian. Um, yeah, he, he'd be Australian because he, he was in the Melbourne Comedy Festival for fucking years. I don't know if he did comedy in other countries. I know he's, he's a, he's a strange one where he's like, he's like so international where he's he's done years in other countries and in Asia and now he's in New York I believe or LA I can't remember um, so yeah I would say that you know Jim Jeffries like really showed how successful you can become from Australia because he grew up in some like shithole regional Perth town and made it all the way to fucking got to be top ten right in terms of success and critical acclaim in stand-up, of his, of, of like now, today, current living acts, absolutely got to be top 10. So for me, he like just demonstrated like how successful you can be and also how you can do it in your own way. And you can do it no matter how fucked you are and you can do it on your own terms and you can do what you want to do. Uh, and that's always going to be cool for me. And no matter what anyone says, Jim will always be like my one of, one of the greats to me. And one of the most inspiring people ever. Um, so that's that's what I think about him. And he's really showed me how far I have to go, you know. Um, and really, like, you know, I'm only 27. Like, I don't think you hit your peak until late 40s in comedy. Athlete, if I was an athlete, this would be it. I'd be in my peak. Comedy, if you think about it, I'm only really halfway, you know. Like, if you think about the greats that have been consistently great and always referenced as the best and the ones that have like changed the world, they're all 50. They're all like 40s and 50s or they started to get really good when they were 40 and then they changed the world at 50. Like there's no real comics under 30 that I can think of that have really made you go, fuck. Like even Kevin Hart is like, he's 40 something. Bill Burr is over 50. George Carlin was, how old was he? 50s, like late 50s, wasn't he? When he really started changing the world of stand-up. Bill Hicks was not 50. He was like 30-something. So like, you know, to me, Jim is like, fuck, that's the, that's the world record to me. From Australia, anyway. He's like the Usain Bolt. That's the guy I want to fucking beat with all respect to, you know? Like, fuck, I wonder if I could do that. So, I love Jim and I would be I would be sad for him to retire. In terms of your other question, like end game for me, I think the reality of it is at some point you, you get too old to tour. That's just what it is. You can't be getting on planes every fucking weekend when you're 60, you know? Although, fuck, Kiss do it. Metallica does it. Although they're not 60 yet. Metallica two are like crazy. Metallica members age. How old are they? Because if they're still rocking, fuck, 60s. Oh, crazy. Maybe you can. Maybe late 60s, you got to turn it, turn it down. To, so, in terms of my end, end goal, in my head, I want to do stand-up forever. Forever, until my brain stops working. That's how I want... And, 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 until I'm not funny anymore, I will do stand-up. Until the day I die. I would love to do a show in fucking 50 years when I'm 77 and have a bunch of people taking the lift instead of the stairs. A bunch of you cunts just still, oh, I remember seeing him when I was 18 in a little 70-seater. And now I'm bloody as old as he had seats. And I and, and back in the day, we used to use a mobile phone. It's a device you would have in your hand, not like all you bloody kids with your microchips and virtual reality. We used to have to go to shows. And tickets were were $18 back in the day. Now tickets are point 
zero 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 three one six five seven zero 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 one three bitcoin but back in the day we used dollars and cents you see that's my ideal audience if i could i i want to do stand up till i die i think cuz stand up is like one of the only skills where you can really do it until you die like singers and performers you at some point you lose it as long as you can speak you can perform uh, and and that is something that I would love to fucking do is just do stand up until I die sell tickets till I die I think that the the online stuff and and all that kind of stuff I don't think I will ever stop but I do think that at some point I like to tone down the amount of content that I put out because it's it's pretty crazy the amount of stuff that I put out I would love to get the podcasts to a point where they're just massive and then I can do like a few YouTube videos a month that are killer and then just mostly drop stand-up clips and then maybe do a TV show once a year or a big projects once a year that, that has a big budget. That's my goal, man, is to just do stand-up until I die and always be a bit of a menace hoaxing the news and doing stunts and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and and I want to make I want to make it in America. I say I'd say that's my goal. I want to make it in America because you I I truly don't believe you can become as good as you could be without America because just the sheer amount of clubs and population and and opportunities to perform. You know you can't become an athlete working out three times a week. Uh, and you if you're a really good comedian here, you can do a club probably three times a week. In Melbourne we have three clubs now. So you could do, you know, three, four, maybe, if you perform at one twice a week. Eh, it's just not the same. You know, you don't get good doing that. Whereas when I ran around with Andrew Schultz in America, he did six clubs in one night. One night, and he did that every fucking night for 10 years. And that's why he's so good, and that's where he is. It's stage time, and you can't get that here. So that's kind of my goal, is just blow up there. But first, I've got a lot of work to do here. I'm not big enough here just yet. Um, but yeah, man, I hope that answers your question. And, and you know, it kind of makes me sad if Jim's hanging up the hat, but I, I suppose, you know, do whatever makes you happy. I guess it would be, you know, it would be amazing to be able to retire. You know what I mean? That's, I would love to get to that point where I, at, at any moment I could stop and I wouldn't have to worry about anything ever again. I could just stop and relax and come back to it whenever I wanted. That would be cool. Um, the, I think that's what I would like to do is just do st- get to a point where I exclusively do stand up because I love it and I could sell out a theater and I wouldn't give a fuck. I don't need the money. Who cares? I just want to do the show and entertain the people who cares about the money, who cares about the ticket price. I just want to do it. I'd love to get to that point at whatever time in my life that is. Uh, we got another question here from Josh. How do you find motivation to continue your goals? Hey, Lewis, uh, I'm a college student in the US. I've been lacking motivation for doing anything in school, leading me to fail last semester. I've been on a downward curve since my second year of high school. Feels like it really doesn't matter, but my parents and grandparents are trying to get me to keep going by helping finance it. If I drop out now, I will be in so much debt that I don't think I can live with myself. I'm the only child of three that is going to be in college, so that puts pressure on me as well. I do want to finish because of opportunities it could bring up. Any advice would be great. I've been listening to you for about two years, and I've wondered how you keep going. Rude! Oh, man, I've been watching you for two years, and I have no idea how you keep doing it. I would have given up if I were you. <laughs> no, I get what you mean. Um, love your stuff and wish I could see you live. Uh, waiting on a few dollars from a friend and I'm going to become a Patreon supporter. Have a shit one, Josh. Thank you, mate. Okay, look. My response is going to be colored by my ignorance of how student loans work in America. In Australia, they're pretty... They're annoying and they're kind of bad, but they don't ruin your life like they seem to in America if you don't pay them off. Um, so 
keep that in mind. I'm very ignorant to how your education system works and you being in student loan debt, I don't really know what that means. It seems like that fucks you. So for me, the honest answer is motivation is fickle and unreliable and you can't count on it. I don't, I'll be honest with you. I don't want to do this episode. I got to fucking 11. I was streaming. I'm exhausted. I got to get up early tomorrow. I got shows for a whole month. And I, my honest thoughts was, I don't want to fucking do this episode. I don't want to do a podcast. I'm tired. Uh, I, I love doing the show and I want to, you know, fucking fulfill my promise to deliver this all the time. And I want to do it. But my honest thoughts were, before I did this, I don't want to fucking do it. I'll just do it tomorrow. I'll do an episode tomorrow. And I did it anyway. Motivation is fickle. You can't count on motivation. What you can count on is discipline. Doing it anyway. Building up discipline is so much more motivation, more more reliable than motivation. You can't rely on motivation. It is a, it's a fickle thing and it will uh, get in the way of everything else. That's my advice is get disciplined. Sit down every fucking day and do it even though you don't want to. Unless you really, really don't want to do get a job in the field that you're studying, maybe you need to fucking do something else. But there have been countless times where I've gone, I don't want to do this, I want to do that, and then I've done it anyway because I've gotten into a routine. And it's, it's much harder than it sounds, but it comes down to me getting into a routine doing this until that time and every day I fucking do it and every, I set goals for myself that are small. I got a real talk every day. I want to do a video every week and I want to write every fucking day stand up and you just fucking do those little, little tiny goals that eventually build up into big things because if you go, I want to get a degree. What the fuck does that mean? I want to get good marks. What does that mean? You can't get good marks. What you want to do is study. I want to study this much a day and I want to watch this less, less, I want to watch less TV, an hour less TV a day, or I'll be on a net, on my phone for only two hours a day instead of six, you know, and that starts from there, because you give yourself giant unattainable goals of, I want to fucking get good marks, or I want to perform really well, or I want to be the best performing in my class, like that doesn't mean anything, it's not doable, you can't do that, what you can do is study for this amount of time a day, is all read for this amount of time a day. Set those small little goals that will eventually take you to the part to the end goal, which is getting good marks, passing, being the best. That's what it is. Motivation will not get you there. Discipline will. Motivation makes you go, oh fuck, I want to get to the end goal. And then you start and you go, oh, this sucks. Motivation doesn't get you to the finish line. It gets you started but not every time. So many times I wake up, oh, I don't want to make a video. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I can't be fucked doing a real talk, but I do it anyway. Uh, and that has got me to this level that I love and I'm grateful for and I appreciate it. And, it, and all of the shit stuff that I do, every fucking video I didn't want to write or every fucking joke I didn't want to sit down and nut out and every time I didn't want to go to the gym and all that kind of shit, It all becomes incredibly worth it when I step foot on stage and I perform for you and I do the thing that I am truly motivated to do and I truly love, and that is stand-up. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you very much. Email me, podcast at loosebeers.com if you have life advice. Thank you. Fuck you and have a shit one. Get your tickets now, loosebeers.com. My shows start Wednesday. Wednesday and Thursday, come. Come see opening night. If you want a weekend night, you got to fucking book now, all right? Loosebeers.com. We got after pay. We got everything. Uh, what we don't have is unlimited tickets. So would you buy it now? It literally starts in a few days. Hurry the fuck up. I will see you there. Get your tickets. I cannot wait. I'll meet you after the shows. We got merch. We'll be taking photos. Thank you and have a shit one. Goodbye.